let me welcome everyone. I am David Tanner. I am the Dean of Arts and Cultural Resources. Um, and I'm pleased that you've all joined us today for one of the first experience events of the new academic year. So um, fall 22, spring 23. Um, I wanna start off with some thank yous and a few reminders. Um, certainly um, my first thank you goes to our esteemed artist that is visiting us today, Leah Francis. Thank you so much for being here. Um, we're glad to have you, anxious to hear what you're, you're gonna um, impart to us. Um, here at the end of my introductory remarks, I'll give a little um, brief uh, uh, bio for you and then I'll turn it over to you because I know you have a great presentation for us. Uh, but in addition to thanking you, I'd also like to thank um, Yanni Kong who provided the essay for us. And if you um, haven't been in the gallery yet, you'll see this is available um, to pick up. And uh, the essay by um, Yanni, who is a, um, uh, a scholar based out of Vancouver, really provides some great insight into um, Leah's work. Um, although you're gonna hear from her um, as well directly today. Um, I also wanna thank our visual arts committee members um, certainly the faculty and staff and all of our students who support the gallery. Um, I'd like to call attention to our communication staff, um, particularly uh, Carrie Manzalillo and Heidi Ekman who provide um, proofreading, edit editing services, and also wonderful designs um, for all of our graphics. Um, in the CFA and the Friedman Gallery, I should also thank um, my team. Uh, that includes Heather Hoff, um, Stephen Nicodemus, who you saw earlier, who's running everything behind the scenes for us. Um, Kate Mishricki, who's our registrar, who worked closely with Leah um, to get make sure all of the, the things arrive safely and record them. Um, and then Rich Hauk, who sadly couldn't be here today, um, uh, uh, who's ill, but um, I wanted to call attention to the good work that Rich does. Who uh, Rich is our preparator and he installs all of our shows. Um, we also have some great gallery attendants, all students um, that support the work that we do there as well, and we're very thankful for them. Um, now to some of the reminders. In addition to Leah's show, um, which closes on October 6th, we also have paintings by Renal Parikh, um, beautiful paintings um, that I hope you'll come in and see. That show closes on October 6th as well. Um, and then in our project space, the small gallery, um, we also have a, a print portfolio that's from our permanent collection. We acquired it last year. Um, the artist who um, organized it is Melanie Yazi, and um, she's a Navajo artist and educator um, out in Colorado. Um, there are over 30 um, artists who participated in that portfolio, uh, and she organized it to celebrate the legacy of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and her um, passing, the anniversary of her passing is coming up um, soon. And so it's very um, timely that we have um, those works on display. Um, that also represents um, printmaking and a variety of techniques. So those who are interested in that medium should definitely come out and see that. And if you're interested in Ruth Bader Ginsburg, I think you'll um, enjoy the show. Um, that closes on October 14th. Um, coming up next weekend, we have a couple of events in the gallery for all of these um, shows to celebrate them. Um, on Friday the 16th, um, we kick off homecoming with our Constitution Day celebration, really focused on um, uh, the Ruth Bader uh, Ginsburg exhibit, but all of these shows, um, Leah's show, Renal's um, work as well, will be available for people to view and come in and see. Uh, and enjoy. As well, there also will be a new mini exhibit upstairs in the CFA mezzanine um, of work from the Black Cultural Collection. Um, three masks um, uh, based on African traditions will be on display. Um, this mini exhibit was um, created as part of a um, course uh, last spring, uh, History, I think 183, that was taught by Professor Cami Fletcher. Uh, and the students who provided research uh, and worked on the exhibition. So come and see all of that um, on Friday. Um, you're also welcome to come in person to the virtual tour on Sunday. And if you're not with us in the area, you can check that out on Facebook Live. That'll be from 2 to 3 p.m. on Sunday the 18th. And again, the Constitution Day event and reception for all of the um, exhibitions and the Freedmen 
is on Friday from 4.30 to 6.30 to kick off um, homecoming. Um, this show, um, Leah's show, will have a closing reception. That's going to be on Thursday, October 6th, and Leah will be present for that. So we're super excited to have um, her join us. Um, that's from 5 to 7 p.m. Um, that also serves as our welcome event for the Board of Trustees who will be meeting and as the celebration for Empowering Albright Voices to kick that event off, which um, will occur the following day. But that night, we will have um, the opening event, which is a keynote by Dr. Patrice Rankin, and that follows the event in the gallery. So um, once you have some great food and get to meet Leah, you can then um, head up and, and hear Dr. Rankin speak. Um, if you're interested in coming by the gallery and you haven't seen these shows, the gallery is open. Tuesday um, through Friday from 9 to 5, so 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., and Sundays 1 to 4. Um, last little bit of housekeeping, um, this is an experience event, and for those who might be new, some freshmen that are with us, um, the way this works is there are two polls um, that will come up. Um, the first poll will be after Leah's first presentation, um, or her, her presentation, um, and then we'll open this up to a Q&A um, where you'll be able to uh, ask Leah questions. If you have questions, please put those in the Q&A um, box that came up before. Um, and then at the end of that, we'll launch the second and final poll. And you do need to take both polls to get experience credit. Um, so stick around for that second poll and make sure that um, as you're thinking of questions, you pop them into the Q&A um, as the presentation is happening. So having covered all of that, um, let me welcome again Leah Francis. Um, Leah uh, was originally born in Canada. Um, she received her MFA degree from the Tyler School of Art at Temple University. Um, her first photo book um, called American Squares premiered at the New York Art Book Fair in September 2019. That was organized by um, MoMA's PS1. And her second book, Lunch Poems, is scheduled for release later this year. And I'm sure she's going to talk a little bit about that as well. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Leah. And thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me, David. I guess I'm going to share my screen somewhat immediately. Can you hear me OK? Yeah. Yeah. OK, so thank you for that introduction. And um, hi to everyone. Welcome. And thank you for taking the time to tune into my artist lecture this afternoon. Um, just a note, this presentation is quite visual in nature. So if you do have the opportunity to make it full screen on your device, you may have a better experience. Okay, after that, let's start. Um, I've divided this discussion into three parts. In part one, I'm gonna give a little history of myself, of how I got into photography, and show some of my earlier work. And next we'll discuss some of my photographic influences. And last but definitely not least, we'll take a closer look at my show that is hanging uh, right now at the Friedman Gallery. So, um, so for part one, in the background, I'll be flipping through a series of mine that was published as a book in October, 2019. It encompasses photographs that I made between 2013 and around 2019. And these will be in rotation on the screen as I speak uh, to the motivation behind that earlier work. So I'm going to press play. There we go. Um, so this particular project titled American Squares, it kind of began in my mind well before I picked up a camera as an adult. In 2005, I moved to Brooklyn, New York from British Columbia, Canada. And around that time, I used to walk in a neighborhood um, pretty close to my apartment that was quickly changing. I noticed that in a lot of the bars and restaurants springing up around me, the interiors were designed to mimic the look of a particular period in America's past, generally from the 1940s through the 1960s. And I began to wonder about this like idea of America um, that was from an earlier era, one that was not modern, but which I was seeing emerge as a trend. And I started to think about these recreations of that period and how most of us have not actually experienced that time firsthand. Although we may have seen it sort of through uh, the filter of scripted movies or television programs we may have encountered on the screen. 
It was actually interesting to me that the look of the era that I was seeing recreated did match up with a particular vision that I had of this country, and that may be an immigrant's idea of America. It's kind of a sticky snapshot in my mind that I carry around, um, one with big cars, gleaming diners, neon signs, the open road, a kind of romantic and idealized mythology of America. But I hadn't noticed the same phenomenon in Canada, and I personally didn't have that same picture in my mind about any certain time in Canada. I don't think most Canadians do. So Canada has never been like the richest country in the world or the most powerful country in the world. Um, to my knowledge, it has not declared itself to be the greatest. So it's not really a particular period to which Canadians, at least ones that I know, wish to return. There's sort of no pinnacle to look back on with desire. Anyway, flashing forward now from where we were in 2005, and I'm wandering my neighborhood, musing about nostalgia, we're now in 2013. And after having taken quite a long break from photography since a, a course I took in high school, I was inspired to start making pictures again. The photographer, Stephen Shore, who we will speak about later, had actually done a photo shoot um, for a publication where I was working at the Wall Street Journal magazine, and when I downloaded those incoming files, the quality of light in the photographs was really extraordinary. And in part, I credit those images for reactivating my passion for photography. It was actually a fashion spread for Prada. And just like I had noticed years earlier, the fashion itself mimicked the look of the 1950s. Um, so it was at that point that something really clicked for me. And I wondered whether a camera could help me to investigate the questions I still had about the rise in nostalgia I continued to see all around me, where it came from and what it might mean. So I began to make this work really in response to my own need to understand what I saw as America's fascination with its past. Um, I constructed a practice for myself and I decided to pursue this line of inquiry in an almost archeological manner. I would research the places where I thought I could find the objects remaining from the time I saw repeating itself today. And I would go to them, the things themselves. I started figuring out ways in which I could compose photographs to leave out maybe certain items from the present, um, either through composition, through controlling depth of field, or by blowing out the windows if, for example, there was a modern car in the frame. And the act of making this the photographs in this book that you're seeing kind of had the feeling of time travel for me. I tried to create a portal for myself while I was composing the images with my camera and hopefully for the viewer doing the looking at the resulting photograph. In a graduate photo class I took while studying at the Tyler School of Art recently, we read a book by Rebecca Schneider called Performing Remains, Art and War in Times of Theatrical Reenactment. And in it, she introduced a concept from the traditional Native American sense of history, which was in fact something I was already trying to tap into with this work. And that is basically what has happened in a place is always happening. So the past is continually taking place in the present. And I've just got one more little slide here to go through. And then, Summary. Um, so in summary, at this point, um, really central to my work is my fascination with how we form notions about time and place, where these come from, and how they live in our minds and in the world. So now I'm going to speak about a few of the photographers that have influenced the way that I look through a camera, as well as the resulting photographs that I print. And I really hope that in discussing their work, I will also shed light on my own. I do want to mention that two of the four photographers I'm going to reference here are really among the most famous and successful photographers of all time. Um, I do look at a lot of work and I adore so much that's made by a diverse group of current photographers, but these people were among the first photographers that I was exposed to when starting out. And in some ways they made kind of an indelible impression upon me. So first up um, is this photograph by Dave Giordano. Dave is from Detroit, Michigan, and I know him best for his early work made in Detroit in the 70s. 
I wanted to talk about this photograph in particular because backtracking a bit, um, soon after I picked up a camera as an adult, I took a trip to Los Angeles uh, where I made a bunch of photos and they were kind of interesting, but not that great actually. <laughs> and so I decided I should probably take a course. I ended up at the um, continuing studies at the International Center of Photography in New York. And my teacher there, Palmer Davis, showed some examples that really shaped how I communicate through photography, or at least try to, to this day. And the first exercise that we did um, probably influenced me the most. So we were asked to make one photograph that expressed something negative and one that expressed something positive. I twisted that kind of a bit and tried to take photographs of the temperature on two different days because I really dislike warm weather. And if you think about it, um, warmth is not the easiest thing to communicate in a photo. A day might be like really super sunny, but cold. So you're kind of relying upon um, happening across a subject that tells a story for you or noticing small cues in a scene that when you make a picture will hopefully communicate the message to your audience. So for example, in this photo by Dave Giordano, it, well, at first it really struck me and for some reason that stuck with me for a long time. Um, but I personally felt like the bar looked really hot and quite stifling. And I'm really looking at the way um, it's quite bright out and yet the curtains are drawn. And we all know how sunlight can come streaming through and we need to shut the curtains. Um, so the sole patron here is sitting really close to this box fan as well. He's also sitting by the television set that might have something to do with it. Um, and he's kind of slumped against the bar. There's a lot of light coming in. We see light dappled on the left-hand side. We see it hitting the stool. We see it across the bar. And he's also wearing a lightweight shirt. So I really love how these subtle details seem to come together to create a scene. And Giordano kind of presents these to us and asks the viewer to do the work of putting those together. Um, this is a picture of mine, and it's actually in the show at the Friedman Gallery right now. I thought it was kind of a good example of a similar working method. I made this photograph during the height of the pandemic. And this restaurant over here, Tony's Lunch, is closed. Um, that's the owner here on this chair. Not only do the subjects look warm to me, but because of their body language, they look kind of defeated. And I composed the image with them small in the frame because I wanted them to sort of bear the weight of the closed business. This sign lo like looms really heavily over them. And we also have this exhaust fan, which is almost comically large. So these two markers of business and industry um, dominate the foreground while the humans are somewhat diminutive. So many decisions were being made about our health versus the economy during the initial COVID shutdown. And I thought that the scene spoke to that. Some may just see this photo of a cool sign and that's okay. Um, but if you look more closely, there's more you could interpret from this if you wish to do so. So like Giordano's photo, I was trying to communicate a message through several small details, and it's really up to the viewer to interpret the meaning as they see it. Um, next up is William Eggleston, and Eggleston is a photographer from Memphis who was born in 1939 and is still creating work to this day. So here we have what could have really been an unexceptional suburban snapshot, um, but it has one unexpected feature. And that's really the viewpoint adopted by the photographer. So he, this is taken from a really low angle and that m kind of monumentalizes the child spike. Eggleston could almost be lying on the ground in the front of the photo as he took this. So you can see this parked car through the tricycle, um, rendering it in contrast quite small. And the trike is shot, or you could say composed or framed in such a way as to dominate the foreground. So this is a clear example of a photographer using composition to aid or to create meaning. Um, the way it is photographed, we understand, I hope, that a bike could mean everything to a kid. So this Eggleston example and a couple more that I have were really the first time I became aware um, sort of, of what limited tools we kind of have as photographers in a way, um, but how we might take full advantage of them. In my picture here, I chose to compose the photo from a relatively low angle as well. 
in order to kind of sandwich the subject between the ceiling and these bowling ball racks, I'm actually sitting on a bench down at the front. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but I'll give it a shot. Um, <laughs> and um, so uh, this was taken during some of the last days that this bowling alley was open and I wanted to convey a kind of desolate feeling. The 89 year old owner is the one doing the sweeping up and it's during what should be prime time, but there are no customers but myself and my husband. So I chose to show a really large portion of the ceiling to have it kind of way down on him. He's also small in the frame. Um, he looks kind of vulnerable. I found it really quite sad that this alley was closing and I tried to use composition to hopefully portray that. I really could have framed this in so many different ways and not gotten an emotional photograph. And so, you know, one really has to think about how to compose a picture in the hope that it will communicate your story. Um, possibly because of Eggleston's influence, it's become quite central to my work to show my point of view within the picture. Um, here you'll notice that you can tell really exactly where the photographer is sitting. I feel like that's something that helps the viewer to almost enter into the photo. And a lot of people tell me they feel like they are right there with me when they look at my photographs. And that's because you actually kind of are. Like William Eggleston, I use what's called a fixed lens camera. So there's like no big zoom in lens. Um, I'm really right there standing or sitting exactly where you think I am. So he is obviously sitting in the booth behind the woman so as a viewer you feel like you're there too I mean you can't you can't not so I think this kind of helps you to share in the experience in my photograph um, I snapped the shutter from inside of my friend's car intentionally leaving this door frame in the picture and my hope was that by making my point of view apparent the observer could really feel like they're sitting alongside me in the car in framing a composition, um, I also find that little details help, like the inclusion of the shine on these puddles in the parking lot. These types of things like reflections, steam, light, dark, shadows, all lend an air of familiarity, um, which I hope allows the audience to be transported or to have a similar experience to what I had when making the picture. So with good reason, there is a BBC documentary called The Colorful Mr. Eggleston. And the British photographer Martin Parr has described him as the supreme colorist of American photography. This image, Untitled Memphis, is said to be Eggleston's first successful color negative. And it was taken just as he started experimenting with color photography. When starting out, Eggleston apparently felt hampered by being in Memphis, which he considered to be ugly. <laughs> But his, his wife said, why not photograph the ugly stuff? So shortly he actually became known for his hallmark ability to find emotional resonance in the ordinary. And one way he achieved this was through his use of light and color. And I've read that for Eggleston, there is just as much beauty and interest in the everyday and the ordinary as in a photo of something extraordinary. He calls this his democratic method of seeing, and one of his most famous sayings is, I am at war with the obvious. So here that in the teenage boy's profile, his left arm registers the warm afternoon sunlight, and the dramatic lighting kind of pulls him out, um, out of the everyday. Both these photographs, which I made in Shemokin, Pennsylvania in 2020, rely upon a similarly golden-hued light in order to transport the ordinary into the realm of the extraordinary. Many people don't realize that this light only occurs for a very short period of time, um, either just before sundown or just after the sun rises in the morning and only on the occasional day. So I have spent countless hours driving to locations and waiting for this light only to have it not appear. It's, it's really not uncommon at all. Um, Next up is, are some photographs by Bruce Wrighton, who remains really a big favorite of mine. Um, his artistic career continues, uh, sorry, consists of work um, made in the mid 1980s with an eight by 10 view camera in the vicinity of Binghamton, New York. And this work is from a series called St. George and the Dragon. It represents an investigation into the power of images and icons, both secular and sacred. 
that write and discovered in local taverns and diners and churches and houses. I'm really so inspired by the way he captures um, light and color. And I find the light and color in Wrighton's work to be slightly more subtle than in Eggleston's, but yet powerful, resulting in an almost dreamlike um, effect in the finished image. So in my photograph on the left, Los Angeles, California, 2018, I managed to capture the light on the wall sort of in a, a similar fashion, I hope. And I'm also looking at this Coca-Cola symbol, which I find to be like a real icon of American culture. And I tend to capture a lot of those in my work. So whether it's a glowing Wurlitzer jukebox or a, a floating Christ figure, um, or a simple painting on a barroom wall, Brighton sought to better understand the power of these icons and images and how they kind of transcend our everyday experiences. In my photo on the left in New Orleans, Louisiana, um, I too look at the sacred found next to the everyday. And the simple sound of my work will be something we discuss a little later on when looking at my current show. Um, last up is the photographer, Stephen Shore, who is similar to my other influences um, in his subject matter, to my mind. He's interested in ordinary scenes of everyday life. Composition-wise, I've always felt like Shore's uh, work was primarily about seeing. I feel like he's asking, like, I see exactly this. Do you see it too? As opposed to the snapshot-like aesthetic of William Eggleston, very shortly into his career, Shore became more of a formalist who lines up everything in a carefully layered composition. So you might notice that um, the windows on the left side of the photograph are like perfectly straight lines. On the right, everything is perfectly straight lines. All of these poles are perfectly straight. Generally, one looks for the one best straight line but in Shore's photos, they are all perfect. So um, yeah, that's something I aim for and have not achieved. Um, anyway, so the spaciousness of his images to allow the viewer's eye to wander and maybe to alight on the subject of the photo, if there is one, as the subject may be the entire scene. The viewer feels as if they were maybe there surveying Gull Lake, Saskatchewan for themselves. Um, in my photograph, St. Clair, Pennsylvania, 2020, here on the left, I employ a similar method of coaxing you to walk through the photo. I left this gate in the frame in the front so you could tell exactly where I am. You have my point of view. And I use these lines in the crosswalk to sort of lead you, your eye deeper into the image. And yet there's a stop sign and, and maybe that provides some tension. Um, I do just love this photograph, uh, Washington Street, Struthers, Ohio, by Stephen Shore, perhaps because it looks something like or similar to the area where I live now. And it may appear that the subject of the photo is this smoking stack in the background, but Shore really lets you wander through the scene, taking in the homes, the socioeconomic conditions, the kids' bicycles, and ultimately you come to the fact that families and pollution are coexisting so close together. The viewer is left to come to their own conclusion. Um, in journalism, at least in writing, that's called bearing the lead. And I feel like Shore really does that so well. I laughed a little bit when I found this uh, quite similar photograph in tone and color, at least in my own work, which I took um, this past summer in Bonavista, Newfoundland. So I'm in a car and it is raining, um, hopefully adding to the atmosphere. You might be able to see the raindrops on the windscreen. So, well, for many of us, um, the ocean might be the hero of our pictures. If you live in this town, it is likely receded into your every day. So it's somewhat buried in the frame to reflect that. Your eye, like in the shore photo, has to make its way like through the town, down the street, past the houses, to the ocean to finally get to the water. Also in 1992, the federal government of Canada shut down cod fishing in, in um, Newfoundland's Northeast coast, eliminating the livelihoods of 30,000 people. So I'm also kind of referencing that changed relationship to the sea for the people of Bonavista, Newfoundland. The, um, they no longer gain their livelihood um, from the ocean. And so it's kind of slipped a little bit more into the background. 
So in summary, I spent quite a bit of time explaining my influences because I kind of wanted to use those details to go a little into my process. Um, my photos are hopefully both of something and about something. And essentially what I try to do is include as many ingredients as possible for the viewer to look more closely at my photographs for meaning if they wish to do so. Now we're gonna discuss uh, my show, which is currently up at the Friedman Gallery. And before we start, I wanna reiterate what David said. Um, Albright was so nice to produce a brochure for the show and to have writer and cultural critic Yanni Kong reflect on my work in the essay. The brochures are available at the gallery. They contain the full essay that she wrote, which I really adore. So I hope you get a chance to read it. Um, so on March 11th, 2021, President Biden announced the goal of getting the nation closer to normal by July 4th. I made these photographs during the Trump presidency and the post-Trump era with one coast underwater and the other battling unprecedented forest fires, the climate crisis destabilizing life as we know it. With anti-abortion vigilantes empowered by law in Texas, George Floyd murdered on a Minneapolis street corner and the storming of the Capitol by groups including far-right militants and white supremacists. As of September 8th, 2022, 1,044,912 Americans have died of COVID-19. And much is missing from this list, yet America is back. This exhibit highlights third spaces, components of an area's social infrastructure, like communal spaces outside of home and work, such as taverns, church picnics, diners, restaurants, and movie theaters, sites where we might gather if we could agree. Many of these venues have become devastated by the coronavirus pandemic or by extreme weather events, both of which have become politicized. My photographs are mostly empty of people, Yet pushed back chairs or half finished meals on tables show that life did occur here. Pictured are scenes where things might still happen, once happened or never happened. Yet let us not be buried in collective amnesia. Things were never normal. The locations I chose are particular, left behind by declining economies. They also reference an idealized American mythology persistent in popular culture from Edward Hopper's Nighthawks to Gary Marshall's Happy Days and Tony's Last Meal on the Sopranos, we've all absorbed, for instance, the diner as a recurring motif. Today, in a deeply polarized United States, scenes such as these are often associated with nationalism and nostalgia, mobilized for political use and linked with characterizations of authenticity. In his book, Landscape as a Weapon, Cultures of Exhaustion and Refusal, John Beck wrote, quote, what is disturbing about the tendency on the right to insist upon a falsified version of the national past as a lost utopia is that this version of history is currently serving less as a comfort and more as a model for the future, end quote. So actively using photography to explore the residue of time and human effort, I create portraits of place, mindful of the individuals who have been there before and may be there again. Imaginary one-to-one -one conversations with these ghosts, so to speak, allow me to invest in the possibility that within this divided nation, we might one day understand and respect each other. I harness light to grasp that moments of joy in complicated environments. Um, in, an, in an attempt to pull myself out of today's prevailing us versus them mentality and the fear, anxiety, anger, confusion, and disappointment I have been feeling. If half the country is engaged in backward looking, what are they seeing? So with these images, my attempts to go to and document the things themselves, I hope to create an opening for deep looking and the exploration of multiple layers of meaning, an encounter with complex histories rather than one dimensional familiar tropes. And these are some of the sources that I, I used and read um, in sort of thinking about this show and in writing that statement. And I'm just showing them because it is the 
proper thing to do. Um, so there you go. And now I'm going to examine more deeply a few of the photographs in the show that you just saw flash before your eyes. I once read, and I wish I could remember where, there are two types of photographers, sculptors and collectors. The sculptor's type maybe starts from scratch and builds or sets something up and then takes a picture of it, maybe in a studio. And the collector type wanders and finds things. I am definitely the collector type. Um, sometimes I think I bring pictures home, so to speak, that I've sensed might be meaningful, and then I find the meaning later. And other times I go out collecting, looking for a particular image to help tell a story. So this photograph is definitely a case of my going out to collect an image intentionally. Here we have the trolley car diner in Philadelphia. And I made this picture the day before they closed their doors for good. Um, what I was already beginning to look for in 2019 and what was shaping my process were communal spaces such as diners, which I view as quintessentially American, but ones which were empty. In this photograph, humans are palpably absent, yet traces of humanity are found in the remnants on the table. One might look at this and wonder what happened here. In photographing a space, um, the diner, which has become so intertwined with ideas of America, like through films, through television, maybe books, um, through comics even, and choosing to photograph it empty, I'm trying to draw attention to the fact that we are no longer gathering as a, a society in the way we once did. America is a polarized nation, a divided country, and I made this picture highlighting the emptiness at this table as a metaphor for the current and ongoing division among American people. Uh, this photograph was taken through the window of Wolf's Diner in Dillsburg, Pennsylvania. I pulled up and they were closed and there was no sign on the door. My inspiration for this photo came from conversations I had been having with two editors from the Carnegie Museum of Art. They had asked me to make or to gather photographs of mine in response to a video piece by the artist um, Doug Aitken called Migration Empire. And in his video, he features wild North American migratory animals that have been relocated from their natural habitats to vacant motel rooms. So picture a mountain lion as a guest at a roadside motel. <laughs> The animals engage with the man-made environments according to their feral instincts. And the mountain lion, let's say, is playing on the bed and in the process, he unintentionally destroys it. So basically, my take on that is that Aitken's work is a comment on humans pressing up against the natural world and on the extinction or near extinction of so many species. I was thinking about that and I wanted to take it a step further. As our businesses emptied and closed during the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, to me, the world began to look almost post-apocalyptic. So instead of humans pressing up against the natural world of animals, it was like we ourselves were absent from the world. And I was thinking in this instance, particularly about extreme weather events, forest fires, flooding, the warming climate, would the world become uninhabitable and when? And how would that look? So there is and was so much going on at this point and much of the way I was seeing the world was amplified through anxiety, something that I'm sure many of you feel. Um, as Yanni Kong wrote in the essay that I mentioned earlier, quote, the works in the show were made in a moment that for some signaled political devastation, the presidency of Donald Trump, Trump <laughs> extreme, climate crises, a global pandemic, a raging race war, a political insurrection, end quote. So in this picture, I'm pressing my lens up against a window actually, and we see the man-made object, the jukebox, but it's not being played. And we also notice the plant life. To me, through a trick of reflection, it's almost as looks as if it's grown over, as though the, the plants are overtaking a vacant human world. In making work for this show, um, while many of the images are close up and detail oriented, I also tried to include some that pulled back and gave a sense of place to where I was. Um, this picture was actually not taken in Pennsylvania, but nearby across the border in the Rust Belt of New York State. 
It is, however, fairly representative of the towns where I photograph most. I think it's important that while I may pick and choose what I want to show you, um, from time to time, I reveal the broader surroundings. I did include a diner in this composition over on the left, um, but for, not from a typical angle. You're still able to see all these boarded up windows and the lack of traffic at the intersection. And as of this past summer, unfortunately, the diner is closed and the signage is gone. And another influence when thinking about this work um, was a book that I referenced earlier, Landscape as Weapon by John Beck. In it, he writes an interesting phrase, um, quote, how the past is remembered by whom and for what purpose, end quote. So here we have that same location in 1987. And this photograph is taken by Bruce Wrighton, who we discussed earlier. Um, you can see that if this was your memory of that place, or if you saw it in a book now, um, and this is all you saw, you might have a very different impression than the reality of conditions in this town today. All right. I included this photo from Pottstown, Pennsylvania as a really relatively straightforward documentation of the pandemic. Um, these booths are chained off for social distancing and the jukeboxes were turned off, but the owner turned them on for me. And I also found this centipede on the vintage arcade game that kind of reminded me of a virus. <laughs> but when I researched the game Centipede from 1981, I discovered that it actually had been co-designed and programmed by a woman, uh, Donna Bailey, which was really rare at that time. And Bailey was one of only a few female game programmers in the industry and the only female employed in Atari's game department. It was one of the first video games with a significant female player base. So when I'm thinking about what photos to include in a book or a show, um, there are often little facts like that that interest me. I mean, I'm a female photographer and will influence my decision, but um, you know, not many people know these things, but I think it's kind of fun that maybe a few people looking at the photo might know that. I made this photo in a restaurant called Nancy's Revival in Wilkinsburg, Pennsylvania. Symbol wise, there is a lot going on here in my opinion. Um, right away, I noticed the juxtaposition of this phone booth, which is denuded of a phone, signifying to me a lack of connection with the frame on the wall over here on the right, um, full of patrons from an earlier time. It's quite a stark contrast. And the dots of their faces in these photographs, um, to me, kind of mirrored these shapes of the holes left behind by the removed wires. Um, then I saw this dead plant and I got to thinking about our environmental crises. There are colonial symbols all over this wallpaper, which you probably can't see here, but in the gallery, if you see the work, you can definitely see it. There are apples and apple pie on the curtains and even the umbrella holder has um, a picture of a crowded pub. So there's so many symbols going on. Um, and yet the booth itself is, is empty. Even the Sriracha bottle on the table um, might point to globalization, but it also reminds us of the terrible rise of anti-Asian hate crimes in recent years. So overall, this image to me speaks to the issue that we are no longer communicating with each other in a healthy manner. And were we ever? Much is broken. Can it be fixed? Um, this photo from Danielsville, Pennsylvania captures a really personal and meaningful moment in time for me. And I, I really hope it's obvious, but each time I'm out there with a camera and you see the resulting photo, I'm also having my own individual experience as I'm making the work. So this was during the first summer of the pandemic when many non-life sustaining businesses were closed and a stay-at-home order was in effect. Um, but after a while, my husband and I figured out that we could leave the house to drive in our own car probably and enjoy a walk if we maintain social distancing. It took us a really long time to figure that out. Um, and on this evening though, the light was particularly moving. And I remember that behind where I took the photograph, the field was full of purple flowers. Of course, counter, to that kind of moment of enchantment that we were experiencing is the melancholy sight of the painted over date 
on the church picnic sign, which had been canceled. Um, I'm including this photo of Tannersville, Pennsylvania to return again to speaking more about my process in making this work. America is undoubtedly divided. And as I've said, um, in order to highlight this fissure in many of my photographs, I focus on communal settings, such as this ice cream stand. As I said earlier, sites where we might gather if we could agree. So in general, there's a conspicuous absence of people from my pictures. And the photos where there are people in the same frame, um, they're generally not making eye contact with each other. So not only have we been kept apart by pan the pandemic and driven to despair by pandemic economies, but we are divided to restate the obvious by politics. And I want to show this separateness in my photographs. Um, so in the shadows of this image, I hope you can see there is a woman alone. There's something ominous about this to me and the telephone pole, which is over top of her appears dangerously close to falling over. And yet on the sign we have, we are open, it's ice cream season, stay safe. She doesn't look all that safe to me. And that was the contrasting mood I was trying to show you. But what I'm not showing you actually is what I've left out when composing this picture. Ta-da. <laughs> Um, hopefully you can see that on the left here, the ice cream stand is actually crowded. Things look pretty much normal. And choosing work for this show, I didn't include this image, but it is in my upcoming second book. I actually find the photo on the left to be unnerving as well. It was taken during the summer, um, the first summer of the pandemic, when a mask mandate was in effect, but you can see that no one is wearing a mask. It's subtle and you have to look at the date on the photo maybe to realize why the image might be capturing a political divide in this nation that the pandemic quickly became politicized. So to my mind, these two images, um, both are anxiety provoking. I'm showing you both of these photos to highlight the choices I make in framing and then choosing images for different purposes and how Obviously, what I leave out of the frame influences the final meaning as much as what I include. So regarding a photograph that I made in Hazleton in 2020, I'm gonna close by quoting a paragraph in Yanni Kong's essay, which I particularly loved, um, which I mentioned throughout this section. Yanni writes, quote, in the town of Hazleton, Pennsylvania, there is a luncheonette famous for their Jimmy dogs. In Francis's photograph, the counter is set to function. After the lunch rush, crumbs are strewn about, dried gravy crusts the sides of dishes, cords and containers are everywhere. It is an ordinary scene in the life of a diner, but she finds something singular. Each element in the photograph teems with human life. In the evidence of the undone, Francis says, it shows all the things that have happened. It points to some things that could happen next. And in what the image doesn't show, it contains the things that may never occur. These foam cups that belong to Nancy and Flo and Verna are probably there to collect tips. But in calling the women by name, the cups become vessels of potential. What does Verna think about her job? Does she like where she is? How much can her cup hold? And that's the end of, Nen of uh, Yanni's quote. So I so, so, so appreciate Yanni's take on this. Um, it is essentially what I hope for when people look at my photos. So in one static image like this, um, a complex history isn't so much danger of being flattened into a tired cliche, but Let's unflatten these. Let's insist on close looking, the personal, the delayed response, the slow reckoning. In carefully exploring multiple layers of meaning, it may be possible to begin to understand one another, to gather again, to discuss our differences. So that's the end of my lecture. Um, I am just going to uh, show this because I mentioned it a few times. Um, my new book is coming out at the end of of September, early October. And if you're interested, you can sign up on the publisher's website, which is aliensandresidents.co um, to be notified of the exact date because it is currently bobbing around in the New York Harbor in line at customs and we don't know what's gonna happen. 
Um, the show contains 30 images up at Friedman Gallery, and uh, this book contains 35 more, so there's a total of 65 plates. And I just want to thank you all so much for your time and your attention and your patience this afternoon. I really appreciate it. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and throw it over to David. Hi. Amazing. Thank you. Oh, wow. <laughs> and so thorough. I I had a list of questions and you answered almost every one of them. So thank you. Oh, you are welcome. Yeah. I, I was very nervous. Um, I understand maybe some of you all understand that feeling of public speaking and nervousness. So I did prepare. I tried. <laughs> yeah, you did a great job. No one would ever have guessed that you were nervous. So thank you. Thank you. So we've got some comments here uh, and, and a question. And I do have one other question as well. Sure. Um, so we're starting to get a few other things here about how amazing it was. Um, Andre Bryant also says, um, I love how liminal spaces are sort of captured with all of these photos. Yeah, we've, we've got some comments about the, the connection with American politics and um, the relation to nostalgia. And uh, that came through definitely in, in what you were telling us, but also in the, the works themselves. I think if people were just glancing at these, you know, they might at first say, oh, I love that. And that's the whole point of it. But that title really, um, I think, hones in on it. Um, things were never normal, um, certainly not for all of us. Um, and I exactly. think that's the, the point that's resonating here. Yeah. Um, so there's a, a couple of questions that we can jump in and then we'll launch our second poll um, after we get to some of these. I think um, I'd like to start with, uh, in the Q&A, there's a, a question from uh, Manira Tucker. She says, how would you define a perfect photo? Oh, geez. <laughs> um, I don't think there's um, objectively any perfect photo. I think that for me, it would have to be very subjective. I think the artists would have to have um, achieved everything they hope to with the photograph. Do you know what I mean? So maybe it's um, just aesthetic that they're trying to get across, or maybe they've also managed to communicate something that's deeply meaningful to them. So, you know, when you have a photograph that really resonates with people, um, that looks the way that you hope that it would, and that communicates your meaning, if that's what you set out to do, then you've kind of made it. Um, but not everyone, you know, everyone has a different goal with photography and with art, with painting, with everything. So I think, you know, it's super personal and you might have a photograph that you love because you feel that it um, accomplishes everything you tried. Maybe nobody else likes it and that's okay, you know? Mm -hmm. So a perfect photograph really, I think it's like rests with the maker in, in my opinion. Good, yeah, really absolutely. interesting question. I've never been asked that. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. I actually have a follow-up, although I think I know based on what you, you've you said, but this occurred to me, and so I'm going to rephrase it um, and say, have you ever been tempted to manipulate the actual physical aspects of what is present in your photograph? By that, I mean, it seems like, and my guess is you don't ever move anything or remove it, but have you ever been tempted to just get that perfect photo exactly the way you want it to tweak something or? I, I don't really, I, um, well, okay, there's a couple of things. No, because I really enjoy the whole experience. So happening upon that thing that I'm looking for is really part of it. And I tried to stress that in the essay, like I am having a lot of joy in making the work, you know, and that's, that's really part of the exchange for me. Um, and I hope it comes through. But uh, of course, like when I've driven, like I drove four hours to Pittsburgh to try to photograph, it's just outside Pittsburgh, that Nancy's Revival place. And they're, you know, I'm about to take a photograph and this guy sits down and he orders like a massive breakfast. And I'm thinking, I am going to be sitting here for hours waiting for him to move. Yeah, I really, I really do want to ask like, hey, <laughs> Do you mind moving for a minute or something? But then, you know, like what I saw earlier, the the scattered stuff, you know, might be moved. It's been wiped down. It's it's changed. So it doesn't really work. And oh, but I, I really do um, wait and lurk. So I will see that people are kind of finishing up and I will position myself 
when we walk into a place, bit of a long story, but I go to my husband, okay, I'll find the spot. And I say that every time so that he won't find the spot. I'll find the spot. And then I go and I sit, I, I look around, I survey for someone who might be just finishing up or what have you, if there's anyone in there. Um, and then, yeah, the minute they leave, I like dash over and quickly generally get one photo before the server cleans up because I don't know that they want their establishment photographed that way. To me, that's the interesting thing. To them, it looks messy. Right. I don't know if I answered your question. I think so. Yes. You did. And, and I figured <laughs> that was the case, but I'm sure like you were saying, you know, especially with light as well, you mentioned uh, yeah. how, how hard it can be to get that perfect light. And, you know, somebody walks into the frame and you're like, could you just move oh, yeah. a bit? Yeah. yeah. But um, I think that speaks to what a treasure these really are to know that you have taken the time and you've captured that perfect moment for you um, to go back uh, to the question that, you know, um, uh, the, the student had asked. Um, yeah, so great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, we also have a, a question from Dr. Pankratz. He says, um, could you share some technical details um, specifically to what kind of camera? I think you mentioned the lens, but if you could cover that again. Sure. So my preference is actually for a Roloflex that I have. Um, it's a, a twin lens reflex camera, a medium format. I don't know if you want to see, you know what a Roloflex is, right? Or do you not? Wait. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my preference is for this camera, which you, you may have seen. Um, and it is a fixed lens, so there's nothing zooming in and out about it. You look down into here and you can pose and you can make like, I, I am a fan of really straight lines and, and I always try to compose in camera. I don't crop afterwards and you can do that here. The light is super glowing, it's wonderful. But in grad school, um, my advisor really recommended that I start shooting more digital work. Um, because he saw that I was a formalist and he didn't think I was making enough mistakes. Mistakes are, lead to creativity, they lead to new ideas. And I really tend to walk up and make like one photo. And um, he wanted me to make like 30 photos and to, to mess up. So uh, I did buy a medium format digital camera. It's the Fuji GFX 50R. Um, Fuji has long since surpassed that camera, but for me, it works really great. It is a fixed lens, and um, I think it's a 50 millimeter lens. So again, there's no zooming in. You got to zoom with your feet. You have to walk around the subject from every angle to see what you're doing, and, and you can't really fake it from across the street, for instance. So you got to get right up in it. Um, and that camera is great and really so much cheaper. So it's kind of hard to abandon now because I can... You know, you got the file, you don't have to scan the film, you don't have, and all that stuff. And it prints very large. I could have printed those pictures in the show probably twice as big. So I, I do really love it. Yeah. So Dr. Pankratz is our um, kind of resident photographer, even though he's a history professor, he takes a lot of the photographs that um, get used for our website and the CFA brochure that you have as well. Uh, so it's not surprising that he would ask that pointed question. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, he, he, he's a great for, photographer as well. Cool, thank you. Um, and, oh, yay, Renal is here as well. So um, the other artist that's in the other part of the gallery. So thank you for joining yes. us. Yes, thanks so much. Yeah. Um, I, I did have a question, though, uh, looking at the camera that you presented and, and thinking about, as you were saying, the, the composition. Um, so, so those are square photographs when they come they out. They are square interesting they are square they're six by six centimeters I think it's the size of the film um, 120 film and that's the reason and so many people ask me that that I compose digital photographs as square as well because I want to have a, a like a continuity in my work and I will only shoot with a digital camera and not every camera will do this where I can choose to see the square as I'm composing so a lot of cameras, they'll just shoot in that two, three aspect ratio. And I, I won't use that because I can't tell like what's in the finished product. And I initially gravitated towards the Fuji because you can choose that one, one square aspect ratio. And I'm, so I'm composing again, like exactly in the camera as much as possible. There's a few mishaps, um, what I'm going to print. So that's why I chose that Fuji. Amazing, yeah. yeah. 
how did you become so articulate describing and explaining photographs? <laughs> <laughs> wow, well, that's that's very nice of you. This is Ryan. Um, thank you. I I really am not very competent in um, articulating or expressing much verbally about photography. So I, I do appreciate that compliment. Um, I would say that the reason that I went, so I'm, I was a self-taught photographer and I was like a full-on adult um, making work, publishing a book, and yet I felt that I didn't um, have the vocabulary or the art history or the like as much of a grasp on what had come before me and what people were doing now because I had never gone to school for photography. I don't have a BFA. So I did go back to school for an MFA primarily um, to go through that rigorous uh, critique kind of thing where you have to talk about your work. I'm super shy. I have an anxiety disorder, I'm just putting that out there. Um, and I'm working on it. And I have been asked to teach in several places and have chickened out. Um, <laughs> but I, I'm looking forward to more events like this so that I, I can get more practice because I do, I don't know, I, I, I really enjoy um, one-on-one -on -one teaching people about photography. I do hope that I have something to offer and I would love to teach if I can just get over this hurdle of, of nervousness. So yeah, it was probably the MFA and the just constant questioning by peppering of things from professors and, and um, colleagues. Yeah. So um, Andre had asked uh, a question that I think you had answered before. It was, so would you say the perfect photo depends on the person and their goal? Um, yeah. Yeah, and then we also have two kind of similar ones about, again, the time of day. So Dr. Pankratz has asked if you're drawn to late afternoon or does it take all day to get lost in America? <laughs> and what is really your favorite time of day to, to, to take photos? Yeah, um, I am drawn to that light. I also go out in the very early morning to get it. Um, it's complicated because I have been lampooned for using that light, frankly, um, because it kind of glorifies the subject of the photo. And when you're kind of having a conflicted relationship with nostalgia and um, such, um, like capturing it in a golden light kind of always spins everything positive. And maybe you're really trying to get down to the granular details of what's happening in a photo and what's real and what's not, not real. And who was that time actually good for? Not everybody, you know? And so I'm asking so many questions. Um, and people did have a problem with my using that golden light all the time. So my answer to that is that um, it, as I began to work on this work, especially during since 2016 or so, um, going to a lot of towns, I would see a lot of signage and things that really bothered me and, and upset me. And my husband began to not even want to go with me. It became very difficult um, for me to see some of the things written around the place and hear some of the things that people were saying. And that light is frankly for me, um, I hold on to it. I think it's something in my presentation about grasping onto this light in complicated situations. It's like a, like a breath of, <laughs> of, of joy um, that I need really to be there. So it helps to transport me out of that like glum depression, anxiety, fear, worry, and anger, and, and to transcend that and to try to make work that I hope like will answer some of my questions and maybe other people's questions as well. Yeah, I love that. It seems like the, the light there is almost like a, a friend to support. Yeah, you. that's that's really cool. I like that. <laughs> I love that. Um, so you, you have several comments about um, what a wonderful job that you've done, and um, they think you'd be an awesome teacher. I don't know if you saw that. So I didn't see that. That's great. So we have one last question here. Um, and again, this is from Ryan so saying he loved the presentation, very enlightening for someone who's never delved into the world of photography. Um, you mentioned some of your inspirations, but how would you say that you found your own specific voice as an artist? That's a good question. Um, and I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I started making work the first time I picked up a camera um, as an adult after sort of being inspired. Like I said, I worked in magazines for a long time and my job was to um, actually what do what's called looking at color. So I would go into a photo booth at 12 and five every day 
and look at work and see how it was going to print. And because I worked at the Wall Street Journal magazine and then the New York Times magazine, I was looking at like William Eggleston, Stephen Shore, like really um, Alex Soth, like just phenomenal work. And probably, you know, um, seeing every single day some of the best photographers in the world, I got a bit of voc vocabulary from that. But um, I got so inspired, finally, I got a camera. And when I walked around, I, I bought this camera, I had a vacation, I went to LA, like I said, I took photos, they had a smudge on the lens from my thumb and they were set wrong, so they were blurry JPEGs, but they really did have a certain aesthetic to them that, I mean, I kind of still have. And I think the photos um, sort of reflect me as a person a little bit. You know, that there's that little saying, like every photograph is a form of a self-portrait. So I think that I had been interested in, um, and I said this, you know, in this idea of like, what's with all the nostalgia? And I couldn't really figure out how to question that with photos. I just started taking pictures of it. And I think, I hope I finally got to a place where I'm finally asking the questions about it with the work. But it, it took me a long time to like, you're trying to critique something or ask about it, but you just end up making it. <laughs> and then, you know, finally, I hope that I've managed to sort of ask more questions with my work or leave some open ends for people. So, yeah, does that answer the question? I don't know. I think it just took a really long time. And I think I was so lucky to have such a really broad exposure to so much work um, at my workplace in the beginning. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. Well, on behalf of the 63 folks who joined us today, thank you so much for sharing that. Again, I'll just say thank you so much um, for joining us. Definitely remind folks to come out and see you uh, when you're here at the end of the exhibition uh, in October. And uh, we will send reminders about that for folks to come out as well. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. That was actually a lot of fun. So I feel good about it. And thank you for your great questions, everyone in the audience and you too, David. And thank you for putting me at ease. I, I really appreciate that. <laughs> uh, you were, you were a true professional. So thank you. <laughs>